glad to hear this lady speak, mention the word environment. If we pay attention to the scientists more and more around the world and here, telling us that unless we make radical, radical, radical changes in our way we are using the, our Earth resources, we are headed for sure toward disaster. The way of life that we are accustomed to will be radically changed. And so what, that's the reason for, for me that public transit is so desperately important. And we in the uh, peace vigil people, we are outraged by the idea that people who want to come downtown on the bus have to give priority to cars in, in order to get off the bus. These mothers with their, or fathers with their ch children and their ba bags of stuff and, and their, their buggies and, and people in, in motor chairs, that switching the motor chairs takes a certain, quite a lot of time for the driver as well as uh, the, 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 the passengers who are waiting. That all this commotion has to go on in order to give priority to cars to make it more convenient for them to go along 11th Avenue. If it's inconvenient, well, let them drive to come by bus or walk. I mean, why should the cars be inconvenienced? It's, it's the pedestrians and the bicycles and the, um, and the people traveling by public transit who should have the top priority. And cities who are smart cities and trying to use smart planning, and there are cities who are doing that, and even Regina talks about it, uh, are, are giving honest priority to the most important people rather than to cars who are really the base of, of a lot of the disaster that's going on in the planet. So, and as for heated bus shelters, that would be great. It would be great to have more bus shelters. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Any question about the, uh, I mentioned to you on Twitter about um, the snow clearing for bus routes yes. and bus stops. Was that discussed at all in the last council meeting? Uh, not what was oh. discussed is uh, what's been discussed at council is about uh, snow, snow roads. Yeah. Which that when you mentioned that, so sorry, 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 was my head. Yeah. 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 Um, there's been talk of having uh, snow roads, so that means after a snowfall, that it's uh, like a bus road, like there'll be lanes that people could park in for 40, 40 hours or 70 hours or whatever it would be while the city clears the streets. Um, it, it's the mayor who's brought that up, so I think there's some, he has an appetite for it anyways. I think, I, I don't know, um, we're waiting to hear back about the, the cost of that versus, you know, um, don't get way off topic here, but yeah. the last council meeting we talked about uh, more money for sidewalk clearing, okay. that actually the city would roughly double its budget from about 400 to 800,000 dollars to clear all sidewalk frontages that aren't private. So right now we clear about, uh, there's 1,200 kilometers of sidewalk in the city, we clear about 40 kilometers, and we would double that. So that would be around all the parks and around all the frontages that aren't in front of private property. Yeah. Um, so it was brought up in that context of what would that cost versus the snow roads. Um, someone else might have a comment on, on the importance of clearing I do. You, none of you got to experience the joy of waiting on Broad Street uh, for the bus to move a block for, during the first snowfall. Uh, there's a bus lane right there, and for some reason the city chooses not to tow cars in the bus lane and uh, enforce that. Like one time last winter, I saw if a ticket's like a hundred bucks or something, they could have made eleven hundred bucks in a in a few minutes and uh, the bus could have got downtown on time instead. Uh, it, may, it just makes sense to tow those cars and make tow truck drivers happy and transit users happy and teach people to respect the uh, no parking signs and no stopping signs. And the same should be said about 11th Avenue at the other end of uh, this street here. It's actually a no stopping uh, area right at the end but people stop to let people out. If the peop uh, city enforced that, uh, then basically there'd be no reason to have cars from Hamilton to uh, Cornwall, and you'd have a bus-only interchange that's safe for people to cross the street to uh, change during uh, uh, bus transfer times, and uh, traffic would have to route around that problem. I have a 
couple of comments. First of all, the city of Regina needs to have a paradigm shift in the way of thinking. Instead of catering to the uh, private vehicles. Anyway, um, a couple of my comments have to do with the silk screening on buses. It's so difficult to see where you are because of the blocked windows. Now, people with visual impairments have been begging the city to have audible stop, like to make something audible. We're approaching this bus stop. Not only would that help um, people who have visual impairments, it would help everybody because it doesn't look like it'll change uh, as far as silk screening. The other comment was about the lady was saying, all equity groups, not just people who are affected by assistance, should be given a low income bus pass. But there are newcomers in the city of Regina who have a hard time making ends meet. And until that is recognized, why can't they have, it's a public right to have transportation. Those are my two major ones right now. Just comment on the, uh, uh, I guess, individuals that may be on federal programs or, or just low income. Um, the, the province subsidizes for those uh, provincial programs, so social assistance um, and uh, the other four programs. Um, we have brought up to them there's other needs, um, low income, uh, any federal programs uh, that could take opportunity of, of, of this and, and there's that demand there. We've heard that. Um, but ultimately, um, they need to uh, help commit to that because they pay a good portion of, of that to subsidize it. Um, and uh, for the city to subsidize the whole thing, um, you would see probably prices increase dramatically to subsidize those particular passes. So the province was good in, in uh, coming to the table to subsidize uh, for those programs, but we like yourself would like to see that expanded. Just one other, I, some of the paratransit users that are here maybe are too polite to point it out, but uh, there's thousands of ride requests going unfulfilled every month uh, in the city. So that's people that can't make it to doctor's appointments, to, um, to their job. So that's a lot of economic and other uh, opportunity lost. Uh, and for people that are getting the short stick, partly because the province has started to fund much less than they originally promised uh, the city for paratransit. Yeah, the cost of paratransit for us to run the cost recovery, we just section them off, or even less, at 11 and 12 percent cost recovery, because it is a specialized service. So, uh, and you're correct in saying um, funding decreasing from the provincial government does make it harder to work within the same, the same uh, funds to provide the same service. Uh, one final thing: we mentioned taxis earlier, specifically with regard to the airport, but I think within the city centre as well the council should consider taxis more as a kind of public transport. Um, even though they're privately owned and they tend to be more expensive, it actually, in, in a city where you have good quality taxi service, it reduces the requirement to own a car. And so in lots of places, I know a lot of people who, if they're in a larger city, they wouldn't own a car, but they have to in Regina because they can't rely on a taxi service on the occasion when they might need to get somewhere and they have to have a car. And it doesn't come. Right, and it doesn't come, and, and people can't afford to be risking that, and so they know they have to have a car. And so if you had a better quality taxi service, there'd actually be a lot of people who would use that occasionally, but the rest of the time would be able to use public transport. But once they can't access, once the, the taxis aren't reliable enough, they then have to buy a car, and then once you have a car to justify the expense of having the car, you might as well use it to get to work and do all those other things as well. And so. If you were considering that more of a public transit service, I'm not suggesting you end up subsidising it and hugely increase costs, 
but there's a whole lot of things the council could do to improve the service of taxis, which I think would have a flow on to increasing the uses of public transport. In, in Wellington, where I lived, I, I know I keep referencing that, but I know a lot of people who will take taxis, uh, will take a bus into town in the evening to go to bars or go to events, and then uh, sorry, we'll take a bus in, and then we'll take a taxi home. But if you know you can't get a taxi home, you're going to drive both ways, and so it's kind of mutually conducive to each other. And so you know things like the limits on the number of taxis and and all that kind of competitive issues that are restricting the number could could actually help the public transport side as well. I'm trying to, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. yeah, integrating various forms of transportation, whether like you said it's a bus, a taxi, or active modes of transportation, biking, walking. Is essential to a healthy transit system. Um, so if you can't make transit for one reason, there's going to be another option, another option for car share, uh, for uh, to get around in the city. Thursday, um, we'll be at the Cornwall Centre in the morning, and I 
evening. It's RCMP Heritage Center. It's up there as well. Okay. Uh, uh, 5.30 in the afternoon. I'll have to get, actually, I'll talk to you. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So there's a biking as part of the transit. Yeah. Yeah. What they have is uh, they're going to have a couple of maps there. So the transit one, the biking one. So trying to connect or develop more bikeways in the city to, to get there. Sweet. That was going to be my next suggestion. So, uh, <laughs> That, um, as far as the plan of how the city grows, actually, I, I would say this, the city actually has very little control over po population. Like it's mostly uh, resource royalties and these things that actually dictate how many people come here. You know, we can we control some of the growth, where it happens and when it happens. Yeah. But as far as people, you know, so someday maybe we'll hit three hundred thousand. But whether it's in our lifetime, I'm not sure. Yet. Yeah. Um, one thing that uh, the official community plan, which has just been before council, um, that actually calls between now and three hundred thousand people. But that's going to be for there to be 10,000 more people downtown in the broader downtown. So that's uh, transition into heritage and the cathedral or somewhere central, ideal warehouses. But that's that's you know, that really changes the urban uh, aspect of the city. And also, another um, part of that plan is that that densification should happen along major transit corridors. So, so there is some some thinking that way that if we're going to have more uh, you know, rentals or condos that are sort of high things, yeah. that they, uh, they happen on places that are accessible to transit. So some of that's. That's happening. Also, uh, Catherine will be happy to hear that. You know, um, the revitalization that's happening in, uh, in, in the, on the tracks. You know, the, the main tracks actually not disappearing. So, yeah. you know, someday in our children's children's lifetime, uh, there might actually be more light rail travel in Canada, east yeah. and west. And, you know, it's good we're keeping that rail line in there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go.